Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today, we're going to be looking at Frederick Child Hassam's The Avenue in the Rain from 1917. This painting is part of the collection of the White House, the seat of government, or the, the home of the President of the United States. And I love this painting. Um, I, I think it's a great example of Hassam's uh, flag series. He made about 30 of these paintings in the last uh, 10, 15 years of his life. And uh, we'll talk all about it, right? So let's get into it here. Um, if you're watching the episode for the very first time, you know that there's timestamps down below. And... Um, you can jump to the parts of the video you want to, to go directly to. So the, the plan of attack is we're going to go through the image transfer process. Then we're going to stain it with some color. We're going to talk about Child Hassam's biography. Then we're going to do... I don't think we're going to do it under... Well, I don't think so. Then we're going to do background, foreground, background, foreground. Finish it off. Two and a half hours, ideally, would be great if we could do it at that in that time. But I always hesitate to make any print prognostications because I always end up a little bit later than I hoped. But as I said, you can always jump to the part of the video you want to go to if you're watching it after it was recorded. So, uh, of course, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when upcoming videos are taking place. Um, and take a photograph of the artwork you created, upload it to our Facebook group. If you haven't joined the Facebook group all, already, what are you doing? Um, and if you want to support the channel with a small donation, as little as a dollar, 25 cents, you can use PayPal, Super Chat, send an e-transfer. My email is on my website and the Facebook group. All of those links including the links to PayPal or down below in the video description there. So check all those out. Let's get started with our first step. Okay, so um, even though this is a relatively abstract painting, um, probably as we'll look at some of uh, Hassam's later work, you know, I still think um, it would be helpful to kind of sketch this in and one of the ways you can do that is by using the free image transfer that you can download uh, that I've already created for you. So here's the original painting. And then here's the outline that I created on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. You can download it and print it out. Let me show you where you can do that. So there's a link in the video description here, and at the very top of that link for the templates is our resources for the basic, uh, for the very first uh, acrylic painting episodes. And then the next, uh, so 50 folders are for more relatively easy paintings, I would say. Some of which are a little harder. I don't know why Walter Salman's in here or Norman, well, even the Norman Rockwell is, that's probably the easiest one I could find. It's a Santa Claus painting, and then you'll see here's today's artist. I do just want to show you that there's another, I don't know, 500 or 150 or so folders here. Um, some of these have way more than just one painting in them, and there's like the Mona Lisa in there, Tom Thompson, Group of Seven, and so on and so forth. So let's click in here. You've got the original painting, and then two versions of the outline. One's a JPEG and one's a PDF. I should mention, um, and maybe it's obvious already, but the original painting is more like that. It's a very narrow, tall painting. So I've used Photoshop and the Content Aware Fill to add a lot of extra to the painting. Probably, you know, it may be a third on either side. Now, that might upset some people or not. Um, obviously, you can um, you can get a uh, you can get a very narrow canvas and paint it at its um, original proportions and dimensions. But I'm I'm pretty happy. Um, I think it's I don't think we're destroying the the meaning of this painting by going a, you know expanding upon it a little bit. So here again, here's the outline. Let's transfer that onto the canvas. So I've printed this out on just regular paper. 
um, on my inkjet printer here at home. And I'm gonna put it on top of this nine by 12 sized canvas panel here. So it comes wrapped in plastic. I take it out of the plastic. I give it a little delicate sanding. And then I apply a second coat of acrylic gesso, white acrylic gesso, and sand that again after it dries overnight. And now I've got a super smooth surface. I love painting on smooth surfaces. That's just my own personal preference, but uh, some people really like painting on highly textured surfaces and um, that is more helpful if you are doing a lot of thick paint. It might be really helpful to have a textured canvas to work on so that that paint really adheres well to that surface. In the same way, if you're gluing two separate things together, you you cut you would kind of scrape it, sand it a little bit, so that those things can kind of there's a tooth that they can kind of dig into. The glue can can find its way in there, right? But if we're doing really thin layers, that's not such a problem. We're not worried about that painting falling off the surface. So and it's it makes it a lot easier to do details when you've got well-prepared surface. Okay, so what I've just done here is I've put some carbon transfer paper. This is actually graphite transfer paper, but they're virtually the exact same thing. Not the, the exact same thing, but they do the, virtually the same thing. So I'm going to very quickly do this here. Because part of the, the way that child Hassam's painting is very loose and so I want to try to keep my own painting as loose as possible so that I f also feel um, uh, that I have the permission to you know take a few creative liberties and paint it in the same kind of with the, the capture the immediacy of this parade or I guess it's not a parade it's just the Avenue fifth I think it's Fifth Avenue in New York City um, in uh, the rain I don't know if there's he, many of the flag series do feature parades which is actually something that he probably picked up from his mentor, uh, Claude Monet. And we'll talk about that when we get into the biography a little bit. Because Monet himself painted a series of kind of grand boulevards with crowds and parades, also relating to World War I. Okay, I think that's good enough. We don't, I don't wanna overdo it there. It feels um, like it wouldn't be a productive use of my time. So I like to save this and keep that just a little bit out of sight. Or it's not out of, it's off of sight for you guys, but it's, I still um, sometimes look at it for information. Okay. Um, so let's go to our next step here. Okay, so the next step here is to apply a little bit of a priming layer of paint, what we call the imprimatura, or the first layer, or the priming layer of paint. And artists have been doing this for, I don't know, six, 700 years, particularly popularized during the Renaissance as artists moved from wooden panels and walls, fresco painting to 
uh, painting on panels and more, even more specifically painting on canvas. And I've talked ad nauseum about, you know, the, um, about that history. But anyway, um, the, the the colors that I'm about to use for this Imprematura are a part of a very simple palette, a split primary palette. And I've been used, I've used the same palette for all 290 plus episodes and it works. I didn't invent this method. It's been around for a long time, but um, I'm doing my best to popularize it because I think if you're just learning how to paint, this is by far the easiest way to go about it. And the, uh, the concepts apply regardless of what other palette you use maybe going forward. So we're going to use two yellows, two reds, two blues because we every color has got a temperature, so we split them into warm and cools. And that gives us a huge range of colors. We can paint about 95% of all the visible colors. Uh, we're gonna use white and generally we don't use black. We mix our own black. Uh, and that's, you know, 33, 33, 33% of warm red, cool blue, cool yellow. But if we use it, we'll talk about it uh, through here. Now, the paint that I'm about to use here is this Amsterdam brand from Royal Talons. It's a Dutch company. And, um, I'm going to use this Azo Yellow Deep as my priming layer. Now, that's not <laughs> the traditional imprimatura. Traditionally, artists would use kind of a rusty brown, reddish color and probably wouldn't even go all the way across the surface. They might do a little bit of underdrawing or underpainting using it. So I'm kind of cobbling together a few different concepts. Now, if you don't have Amsterdam, and I'm not sponsored by them, not paid by them, no one's ever given me a free tube of paintbrush or, or free tube of paint or a paintbrush or anything. All of this is stuff that um, I've purchased and that I use when I teach classes in person. Um, you could use, if you don't, you got Golden, which is way, way more expensive, higher grade paint. You got Liquitex, they make um, a student grade and professional grade paint. Windsor & Newton... Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supplies, uh, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, Nova Color, Chroma Color, but not Museum Color because they just put way too much um, titanium white in their paints to, in order to kind of thicken it. It's it's a cheaper paint, so it doesn't surprise me. But I've tried using these in my classes, and I have. Uh, moved away from them. So let's uh, let's stain this canvas with a little bit of color. Okay. So I put a dollop of my warm yellow and uh, about 40% water and give it a good little mix together here. This is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with uh, acrylic. There's really no need for using water. You know, if you would look at the every acrylic company would tell you that you shouldn't use water. You can. There's the painting police aren't going to come get you, but, um, uh, you know, acrylic paint is very similar in its chemical properties to white glue. And if you're using white glue, the more water you put in there, the more it's going to break down the, the gluing properties of that glue. And there's the, the reason why it's similar to white glue or the function of that medium is to glue the powdered pigment because most pigment is made in a laboratory now and it's synthesized and comes out as a pigment or sorry comes out as a powdered pigment for that powdered pigment to stick to something it's got to be suspended in a medium and a medium could be um, linseed oil that we use in oil paint it could be tempera for tempera paints um, it could be or it's kind of like a gum um, there's 
latex, paint, there's gouache, watercolor, and on and on. Lots of different mediums. There was, um, like Leonardo da Vinci often used very, um, all sorts of varieties of things like um, egg and um, sometimes, sometimes people would use their own spit. That's how, uh, you know, our great, great ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago did art on cave walls as they would chew up things, mash them around in their mouth and then spit them onto the wall, you know, so, or maybe around a hand as a stencil. Anyway, I digress. all that up. In fact, maybe just before I move on, I'm just going to put the rest of my paint on the palette here. exactly which colors and how much of each I'm going to be using, so I'm just going to put a bunch of paint on here. Oh, there's John. <laughs> John says, someone challenged you to paint for only four hours. <laughs> Christine says, thank you, Michael, for these live streams and resources. I really appreciate it. I, thank you, and happy 4th of July for our American friends, for sure. Yes, American Independence Day, which is obviously why we're painting such a patriotic American uh, image. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the fact that this painting resides in the White House... Um, seems very appropriate. Uh, you, you will notice I did not put any cool red in here. I have the tube. I just don't... I often finding I'm using it less and less. Uh, it's really handy for making purples, particularly. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see here. So, in case you're just wondering why I didn't put that on there. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Child Hassam and why he's such an important artist and um, a little bit about today's painting. So, let's look here. Oh, just again, always encourage you to join the Facebook group, upload your artwork to the Facebook group. In two weeks, we're going to be doing a new feedback episode where I'm going to help celebrate your achievements. We're going to... Um, take a look at all the great artwork that's been uploaded on here it's free if you want to participate in that whether you're making today's painting or a previous painting that I've, I've done or you're doing the drawing series or even a painting of your own from your own inspiration a painting of a family or a friend or an abstract artwork upload it to the group and I'll give you a little bit of free feedback okay so uh, Child Hassam was born Frederick Child Hassam um, in 1859, and passes away at age 75 in 1935. So lived a you know fairly long life as an artist, but was one of the most prolific artists of his time, which we'll talk about here. He made a lot of art, and he was very successful during his time. Uh, he was sort of lucky to come around at a time when Impressionism had sort of fought all of the hard battles, um, you know, famously all the, you know, nasty things written in newspapers and magazines and people ridiculing Impressionism. Hassan was an Impressionist, but he was an American Impressionist. He came around at a time after Impressionism had already become embraced by the cognoscenti or cogn uh, the... The literati, the the gatekeepers, the critics had all kind of um, uh, come to embrace Impressionism. And he sort of swept in there after all the hard work was done 
and uh, received all the accolades, which was something that was mentioned at the time, too, that he didn't uh, um, have to suffer the same sorts of uh, um, uh, negative criticisms that his mentor, Claude Monet, for instance, had. So, um, also, just maybe it's worth mentioning that uh, he, I, would, I would consider Assam sort of the second most famous American Impressionist painter, the first and foremost being Mary Cassatt. Mary Cassatt, who we've made, I think, a couple, at least two paintings, two separate episodes on Mary Cassatt. Um, she... She was not only more well known, at least in Europe. She was, I'm sure, way more well known in Europe than uh, Hassam himself was. Uh, but she was the only American to exhibit with the impressionists in the, the impressionist exhibitions that happened throughout the 1890s, um, and also one of the f one of only three women who exhibited with the impressionist, Mary Brockmond. And, oh, of course, uh, Mary Brockmond, and, oh, it's, I can't, that's going to drive me crazy. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, so not only, so Assam, I would, would say, is sort of the second most famous Impressionist, American Impressionist painter, and then John Henry Twatchman was, um, was the kind of maybe the forgotten American Impressionist painter. So Hassam was born in Boston, Massachusetts. His, um, his middle name, Child, and that's the way it's pronounced, not Childe or anything like that, Child, you know, was given to him, um, sort of named after his uncle. It was like a nickname that they had for his uncle. And so that name was sort of given... Uh, to the young boy when he was born as sort of to honor the, the uncle. Uh, another thing I should say right off the bat here, I don't know if it mentions it here in the Wikipedia article, but, uh, you know, the last... Assam was descended from uh, English immigrants that on his mother's side. His mother could trace her, um, her family lineage back to Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne being one of the great early American novelists, uh, most famous for writing The Scarlet Letter and Twice Told Tales, etc. Um, and so, you know, his on his mother's side, there was like ten, well, I don't know, ten, but maybe five generations um, of, uh, of um, English people born in the United States. So they had been there for, for a while. His father, his his essentially, Child Hassam's grandfather immigrated from England. So the the family had sort of was was English through and through. Uh, their last name was um, originally. I, I might be here. Um, let me see. I think I ha well, I have it on my own. Research. I always post this thing. Is the original name? Did I put that in here somewhere? Maybe I didn't. Uh, the, the The original name was was sort of like uh, Horseman or or Horsham. There we are. Okay, so here it is in the Wikipedia article. Um, so the Horsham which I don't know, probably had something to do with someone who, um, you know, maintained horses and stuff. Um, so that was the original name, but over generations and generations, it became Hassam. And that name, coupled with the sort of the dark complexion of child of Hassam, was um, sort of maybe gave people the mistaken impression that he was of Middle Eastern descent. And throughout his life, Hassam, he liked that. He liked appearing exotic and, and 
you know, especially because he's, I mean, this is a guy who spent a large part of his life living abroad in Europe. And I think that I, and that would have been him being an American living abroad was already kind of gave him something unique. Now being an American who may or may not be Middle Eastern just made him like the super exotic, very unique person. And even though there was absolutely nothing Middle Eastern about him, it's something that he played up because he f kind of felt like it kind of gave him a little bit of cachet. You know, it made him a little bit um, mysterious. So, and and I, honestly, that's I've in, in, until I was putting this episode together, I, I thought, well, of course, that's a little bit of his background. And I even had considered using uh, and talking about his work during Islamic History Month, etc. But you know, as I'm like, oh, really? There's, there's, there's no relationship there whatsoever. Interesting. I mean, he even like went as far as using like the crescent moon, the which you see on the the Turkish flag, for instance, as part of his signature. Uh, so he really leaned into that misconception, and so the fact that people like myself uh, had that mistaken sort of assumption was was not entirely a mistake it was something that he promoted so um anyway let's let's move on here so uh his father was um worked in the cutlery business and so was a uh, as part of like cutlery manufacturer and sales and uh, he grew up in a family that was you know, interested in art. His father collected art and antiques. wasn't a particularly wealthy man, like like uh, not the most successful businessman, but enough that the family was, you know, maybe middle class, up slightly upper middle class. But despite the fact that his father was really into art and collecting uh, antiques, his father never really encouraged Hassam's interest in art. So he kind of kept that part to himself. Hassam was, was a, for the most part, especially when he was younger, an entirely self-taught artist. He did not um, take really many classes in like his uh, elementary school, junior high, high school kind of period uh, because the family was not really encouraging it. The family encouraged him to get a quote-unquote good job. So a few of the other kind of hobbies that child Hassam had was uh was swimming and boxing and boxing was a was a pretty popular sport 100 plus years ago 150 years ago and we've looked at a number of american artists particularly who were big boxing fans my i remember my grandfather both my grandparents my both my grandfathers on both sides of the family were really into boxing and had boxed themselves uh, so, uh, I think that was just kind of the the period of time. Like, you're, you know, it's not there's not like Netflix and blockbuster video and things like that to keep your attention at night. Things like guys duking it out in the ring. Well, that gives people something to do <laughs> at night to keep them out of trouble, or maybe get them into trouble. I don't know, depending on the way you look at it. Uh, so, partly, you know, one of the a, a big um, interruption in Child Hassam's life was that his, um, there was a big father, sorry, so there was a big fire in Boston, Massachusetts in 1872, November 1872, and it wiped out, like, a large part of the commercial district, like the warehouse district, industrial area, um, and along with that went, uh, Child Hassam's father's entire business. So he dropped out of school at uh, age 17 to help his father kind of get the business started up again. And afterwards, even though he, his uncle, whom he was named after, uh, offered to pay for his education at Harvard University, he decided he was going to continue working for the family. So obviously family was something that was very important to him. Uh, he also started working in as a in a publishing company, Little Brown and Company, and he worked in the accounting department. So that was probably the first time where he saw 
that you could make a living in a more creative field that you didn't have to do either be like a lawyer or a laborer or a businessman. You could be an artist and you could make a living as an artist because he's he's helping to write the checks to authors just like his, his that he's directly descended from Nathaniel Hawthorne so there's kind of in his mind like hmm you know I just have to figure out what my creative talent is and I could probably make money from it right because here I am working in this publishing company printing books for other authors and they're making money doing it so why can't I make money do it following my creative um, aspirations? So uh, he he moves on. He he um, becomes, starts taking some uh, engraving, uh, or he studies with an engraver as he as he works with them. Um, and so he starts doing things like the letterheads for you know um, clients and, and newspapers, etc. And that he's now kind of officially applying uh, his interest in art to make a living. Uh, he's also self-taught with watercolors and oil painting. So he's trying all sorts of things. Like give this guy credit that um, he doesn't really have much in the way of support for his creative interests, but he's trying as many different things as possible to see if he can find the one that works best for him. Um, so in 1882, he becomes a freelance illustrator. He's illustrating mostly children's stories that are published in Harper's Weekly and Scribner's Monthly and The Century. So these early, you know, uh, very, very popular magazines. Again, this is long before TV, before radio. Magazines and newspapers are the way that one hears news, the way that one um, hears a you know, often books are would be published in installments. You know, every week a new chapter or so would be. So, again, now he's he's becoming a published artist, uh, and he's doing pretty well at that. He uses some of the money as a um, freelance illustrator to to sign himself up and pay for evening drawing classes at the Lowell Institute and the Boston Art Club. So uh, the Boston Art Club was similar to the Art Students League in New York City that we've talked about many times before. Um, and the Art Students League in New York becomes very popular or important in sort of the next generation of artists uh, that we've looked at before, like Robert Henry in the Ashcan movement, Edward Hopper, etc. So Child Hassam is like the generation before that. And he, he's really important in not only um, promoting Impressionist painting throughout the United States uh, because of his success as an Impressionist artist, um, but he's also really important in that he helped establish the United States as a independent cultural force and it, it's it almost seems ridiculous to to say that sentence today now we look at the united states as being by far the most powerful cultural force on earth you know it, when we think of 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 movies television you know most you know uh contemporary media seems to be um, either comes from the United States or is uh, made in other countries, other cultures, with the hopes of getting into the American market, etc. Uh, so, you know, here in Canada, we even have protections to try to support Canadian cultural producers because American culture is so pervasive that it can kind of drown out Canadian voices, right? So it's, it's you know, talk about a massive change here is that when Child Sam was growing up and when he was as a struggling young artist trying to get out there, people, Americans themselves, could care less about American culture. American culture was sort of like the least interesting thing wealthy Americans could possibly want 
on their walls. They wanted stuff from the great European artists, great, quote-unquote, old masters. So um, Assam is like one of those artists that kind of breaks through that glass ceiling and helps alert Americans, particularly art, you know, collectors, museum directors, critics, um, art historians that in the United States and abroad, um, that there is actually interesting stuff happening in the United States and you don't got to go to Paris to find good art. You can find that in your own backyard in New York and Boston, etc. And it's obviously there were lots of great American artists who preceded uh, Child Hassam, but but Child Hassam is really the the one that, um, well, not the one, but is among those that that is on the leading edge of changing, overturning those uh, preconceived notions or outdated um, stereotypes um, uh, against American artists. So he really blazed a major trail, and that's one of the things that makes him a very important artist in the history of American art. Um, so another thing that he does is, again, he had very little formal art training, uh, but he's making a living making art and freelance art, and he's painting in his spare time. So he, uh, he decides to use some of his earnings to go on a two-month-long quote-unquote study trip to Europe in the summer of 1883 he calls this like like the one of the most important kind of periods of time of his life because it's really one of the first times where he sees a lot of of great art with his own eyes in person he goes to great museums in in england and uh holland france italy switzerland i mean he does the whole grand tour there and uh, so he sees a lot of, you know, the great paintings by Raphael and Leonardo and that type of thing. But he also sees art by a few more, uh, well, not really contemporary, but artists maybe of the previous generation or so, like J.M.W. Turner, the arguably the greatest English painter of all time. Um, he also falls in love with uh, Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot. And Corot is you know, one of the great French painters of all time. Both of these are artists that lived, you know, well, maybe a couple of generations before uh, Hassam, um, but were sort of the bridge between that those great old paintings, um, you know, the Renaissance and Impressionism, you know, closer. They really helped blow open the doors to Impressionism, the way that they used color and the the sort of the aggressive way that they applied paint to the canvas where there's no attempt whatsoever to hide brush strokes uh, also especially with Corot there's kind of a democratization of imagery you start seeing peasants working in the fields as opposed to just kings and queens and popes and you know biblical figures so that's, that's also a very important thing because Hassam himself also starts, he becomes really interested in just sort of the, you know, kids playing in the streets kind of stuff, right? It doesn't have to be these heroic pictures of, uh, of statesmen and uh, queens, right? It's, it could just be that kid next door. Could, you could make a painting of them and that would, that's okay. Um, well, he, you know, so this idea, this healthy manual, this healthy, manly, muscular kind of art is also, I think, kind of interesting to mention. Remember, this is a guy who was really interested in boxing, swimming, athletic pursuits, as well as art. And so to try to find an art that that sort of had that same energy, I think is one of the things that he was that he really found inspiring about the impressionist painters is that there's it's not like this long drawn out process. It's like you're paint you're doing it in an hour. It's like it's like a football game or something. You know, there's like. There's an intensity. You're you're making paintings. They're dripping in sweat. You're in the hot sun while you're working it. Right. You're you're. I think artists 
of this period of time kind of saw that as sort of like this, you know, blue collar type of work. Um, so anyway, he gets married uh, to a woman named Kathleen Maud Doan, and they end up having like a, a long, healthy, supposedly, as far as I know, happy uh, marriage. And, you know, but little is known about their private life, which is usually a good thing. Uh, again, we've seen a number of um, male artists, you know, throughout the times who have not been the greatest husbands or fathers. And so uh, the fact that Hassam, uh, there's nothing to report is probably a good thing. Um, what else do I want to mention? So, you know, he's, he's, he, after having been abroad in Europe for, he gets, he's sort of coming back and forth. He moves to Paris with his uh, wife, his new wife. Um, and, but he starts to kind of miss the, the things that he maybe took for granted back in the United States. Like he says, uh, look around you and paint what you see. Forget the beaux art and the models and render the intense life which surrounds you. And be assured that the Brooklyn Bridge is worth the Colosseum of Rome and that modern America is as fine as the bric-a-brac of antiquity. I love that. So he's, he's making an argument that, you know, there is plenty of good stuff in the United States already. Yeah, it's great to go to Rome and to paint the Colosseum, and there's lots of incredible history. But there's also incredible stuff in the United States, more than enough to keep an artist busy for their career, as we later see here. Um, so he continues to, uh, while he's living in Paris, uh, they he's becomes fairly successful again because he's kind of this unique person who may or may not be Middle Eastern American. There's there's he, that brings him a little bit of attention, and every little you know. Uh, hook that an artist can create for themselves to, to help sell their work, they are going to latch on to. Uh, so, uh, he also takes figure drawing and painting classes at the Académie Julienne. And the we've talked about this a number of times. There's a, a lot of the Impressionist painters studied at l'Académie Julienne. Uh, also, we looked at a number of Chinese, Japanese artists who went to school there as well um, this is uh, w was you know a really important school that really focused on these very academic um, uh, foundational techniques exercises uh, mostly to create more quote-unquote realistic paintings but often the, the, that was based on these ancient Greek ideals. So what, you know, there is this idea that Impressionist painting is very abstract and, it, and as opposed to the stuff before, which was more photographic. That's not really the way artists of the time would have seen that. Um, in fact, probably a lot of Impressionist painters would have looked at the, the previous couple generations of work and said, we want something that's more authentic. This is stuff that is sort of exists in the imagination. It's based on things from thousands of years ago. Like, let's paint what we see, not what we sort of, you know, create in, in our imaginations or our minds. And let's paint the light as it reflects off of flowers and people's faces and stuff. And, and so they, the, oddly enough, the Impressionists saw that what they were doing is more realistic than, you know, paintings by, let's say, Leonardo da Vinci. You know, today, if you, were, you talk about that sort of thing, people are like, what? That doesn't make any sense. The Mona Lisa looks more like a photograph than an Impressionist painting. But... That idea of making a photorealistic artwork is something that didn't really occur to anybody until photography becomes more popular in the over the next like 50 years of his life in the early 1920s even really. Um, so I mean, here's what he has to say about the Academy Julian. The Julian Academy is the personification of routine. 
academic training crushes all originality out of growing men. It tends to put them in a rut and keeps them in it. Preferring instead, he said, my own method in the same degree. So you could see again that that idea of academic art is not about creating something original. It's about creating something that sort of taps into things that were made before. Much more along the lines of what we saw, you know, in Asian history of, of, of art making, right? That it wasn't about like blazing a new path forward and doing something that no one's ever seen before. No, 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 no. That's, you want to be doing what your mentors did maybe a little bit better, right? You're, you're like a craftsperson. You're, you're, you learn these techniques and you're perfecting these techniques. So, but you have this younger generation, the impressionists who are like, screw this. I want to do what I want to do. I want to, I want to create something I've never seen before. Um, let me see. So there's a kind of a, an emerging group of artists, impressionist painters called the 10 or the 10 American painters who, and really child Hassam is, is the founding force behind that movement. He's, um, you know, kind of the initiator of that group, and that group sort of rides around on his coattails, to be quite frank. He, because he's by far the most well known, the most well traveled, has the most contacts. Um, and so these other group, this other group of artists, um, sort of like every other group, kind of crowd together as a way of, of um, helping to promote their own, their each other's work because if you have 10 people exhibiting simultaneously all 10 people plus their partners wives kids families and friends all come to that exhibition and before you know it it's not too hard to have 100 people at the exhibition as opposed to one person who maybe as they're just trying to start out can get five ten people there right so that just looks really good if you're a collector you're like wow look at that you know it's like a restaurant like when you see one two people in the window versus when you walk next door and you see there's a lineup out front you're like oh people they must, must be pretty good right so um the 10 painters is kind of a short-lived group you know it's not really it doesn't create i wouldn't say like a major cultural impact i think it's largely forgotten um by this point um before returning back to the united states one of the contacts he makes is he becomes friends or acquaintances maybe with claude uh, claude lome claude monet uh and you know they they may be met a few times briefly but but ended up having uh, an extensive correspondence through letters over the years and um monet being a curious fellow monet uh had traveled fairly widely and well to england at least and i think was kind of interested to see how this movement that he's largely responsible for would grow as it traveled to the united states so i think he, by maintaining contact with Hassam, he's sort of maintaining a little bit of connection to how to this movement, uh, and, and so he can monitor its growth. Really. Um, so as I said, they moved back to the United States in 1889. So um, and settle in New York City. They, you know, have a studio on 15th Ave or Fifth Avenue and 17th Street. Fifth Avenue is 17th Street. That's um, let's just look that up. I used to, I lived on 7th and 23rd. Um, interesting. Okay, Union Square. Oh, okay, so that makes sense. Okay, so I went to art school right here. This is Cooper Union. And so Cooper Union um, is really one of the, 
the oldest, most important art schools in the United States. So that's where I went to. If, you have, if you've never been down here in the Lower East Side, you got to go to McSorley's Old Ale House. There's their sign famously, we were here before you were born. Great bar, like probably the coolest bar on earth. Um, uh, and so his studio is right here, right next to Union Square and the Strand Bookstore. Um, this would have been a really lively neighborhood for him to have moved into. I mean, it's super lively today, but it would have been a little bit more... Uh, well, Chelsea is right over here, so this is where um, I used to live, right across from the Chelsea Hotel when I was a student at Cooper Union. So I just realized I would have walked by his old um, uh, house probably every single day. Let me just, just out of curiosity... Fifth Avenue being kind of like the big business street in New York City, running north south, uh, and you can see all these buildings. Like they, this is probably not too dissimilar from what Hassan would have seen walking down the street a hundred years, one hundred and twenty years before. Right, a lot of these are older buildings. And obviously, a few newer ones here, but. I just find that super interesting, again, that uh, how little maybe things have changed. So what else do I want to mention? Um, so again, remember I was saying that he, he he's singing the praises of, of America and really making Americans aware of how beautiful the United States is. Here he says, New York is the most beautiful city in the world. There is no boulevard in all of Paris that compares to our own Fifth Avenue, where he lived. The average American still fails to appreciate the beauty of his own country. Right? So that's kind of like it. That must have just driven him crazy to meet, you know, wealthy collectors and for them to just sing the praises of Paris. And he's like, are you kidding me? Have you walked outside your front door and seen how beautiful and incredible New York City is? Why do you always got to go to Europe to find interesting things? Why don't you buy American art, support American artists? All right. Um, and these are the same sort of things that Canadian artists were talking about. And really one of the reasons why the Group of Seven was formed a couple decades at later here in Canada. Um, so here just talking about his relationship with Claude Monet. Um... He, he goes up to New Hampshire there, and he kind of there's like a, a group of artists, poets that are hanging around in that area that he joins and spends time there in the summer with them. Um, makes a lot of like uh, landscape paintings in the countryside along the East Coast. He starts traveling all around Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York State. He goes to uh, Cuba. Uh, he later on goes to, I don't know if it's in here, goes to um, Portland, spends some time in Oregon, uh, to California, uh, I think probably in here, he, yeah, he goes kind of to back to Europe, to, to Italy, um, so lots of traveling, lots of, he, he was like a big, I think he, he calls himself the Marco Polo of painting, in that he just was constantly traveling um, and just wanting to see everything, soak everything in. And during this time, he was constantly making art. Uh, it was said that he would be able to make hundreds and hundreds of paintings in the same time it would take someone to make six or seven paintings. So... You're talking about somebody who could make two or three paintings every single day. So during the, the winter, often what a lot, or let's say during the summer, what often artists would do is they would go around sketching, make little, very small paintings, little watercolors and sketchbooks, etc. And then they would go back to their studio when the snow is on the ground and they would make paintings next to the fireplace, right? And oft, like a lot of artists, you know, they might make, you know, five or six paintings during the winter. The end of the winter, 
uh, Child Hassan would open up the windows of his studio and there would be four or five hundred paintings created during that period of time. Which, if you're someone who wants to make a living as an artist, if you've got a lot of art, well, that makes it easier for you to sell it in some way because you've got, you can then send that work to dozens of galleries around the world rather than just one gallery and then whatever doesn't sell there you send it to another gallery and each time there's fewer and fewer paintings he's generating so much work that um, it's it makes it very easy for dealers to do business with this guy right um, because if anybody wants something he's got another thing cooking right um, obviously, again, this was uh, brought him some notoriety. Some of his fellow artists were like, man, this guy is just a hack. He's just grinding out these the same painting over and over again. But I think he was also in the same way that Claude Monet would paint the same image like Haystacks or Rouen Cathedral over and over and over again at different times of the day and different during different seasons. Um, one of the things that Hassam probably learned from Monet was that interest in you know, using the same composition over and over again and trying to really paint the different lighting effects that he saw at that time. Rather than making five or six just perfect big paintings, he's making more and he's learning a lot and becoming very efficient as an artist. And that's something we're going to try to do when we eventually get to this painting here. So there's so much here to mention. I mean... Uh, Goodness, so many great paint. I just want to see what else do I want to. Um, so towards the end of his life, in the last like couple decades, he dies in 1935. So right in kind of the um, early 19 1900s, 1910s, he he makes this whole series of you know a couple hundred paintings. He calls like the window series. And often these are paintings that he makes from his own apartment window uh, in New York City on Fifth Avenue, um, which is what our painting is. Um, but also when he's traveling around, he just opens up the window of the hotel that he's staying in, whether in, that be France or Florence, and makes a painting there. So, And sometimes they feature his wife in the window. Uh, sometimes they feature another artist looking out the window. Uh, but it's a great compositional device. Matisse, a couple generations later, really runs with this whole idea of making paintings and the window as a frame. So you have kind of an interior space with an exterior space, and you can kind of have two pictures in one, right? Uh, so he makes hundreds of these window series paintings. I mean, that's gorgeous. Look at that. Uh, but then he also kind of uh, I think uh, during World War one he becomes a big promoter of um, he, he's a ver he's an American patriot and he makes he he sees these um, these streets lined with American flags as volunteers are registering to go abroad and fight in World War one this is even prior to America becoming directly involved in World War uh, One, and so he starts. He makes these paintings of these flags. I think there's a whole. I got a page here. That's today's painting. Um, so he. There was a whole exhibition here at the National Gallery in the United States, on these paintings, hundreds of these paintings. But he, um, he. One thing he tries to do is tries to kind of auction them off or donate them as a way of raising money for the American war effort to to various levels of success. Um, he's probably not selling his best paintings in order to, you know, he's probably sells the, the best ones and then donates the ones maybe that were left over. Uh, so this is just before I kind of move on here. This is the today's painting. As I said, it is a little bit, it's much wider or this is the version that I'm doing here where I've widened the edges, the sides, and there you see uh, this version here. Uh, what else do I want to mention before? Well, maybe let's just take a little bit of a look at some of his work here. 
So a lot of his early work um, in, in um, the work that he, he makes when he's in France have a bit more color. When he moves to United, back to the United States, they kind of get a little bit more brown and gray again, especially when he's painting in you know, big cities, these kind of um, urban scenes. And then towards the end of his life, they brighten up again. And that's not, you know, shouldn't be too much of a surprise considering the content he's painting. These are some of, like, his great hits here. Um, and, I mean, it's, you could see that not too, you know, it's, it's interesting that towards the very end of his life, you know, you have... Um, or, well, actually, I should mention, in 1913, there's a very famous exhibition that takes place called the Armory Show in New York City. And the Armory Show was, was an exhibition that featured contemporary American artists in one side of, the, of this big gymnasium, essentially. And then on the other side, contemporary European artists. It was most famous because the, the stuff that the European artists were exhibiting were paintings by artists like Pablo Picasso, Henri Matisse, and Marcel Duchamp. And this and you're seeing like Cubist painting, Fauvist painting, ready-made objects by Marcel Duchamp, like the, the urinal. And it sort of, by far, got the majority of the critical attention, as opposed to the American art that, you know, um, Child Hassan was kind of like the leading... Uh, most probably one of the most famous American artists exhibiting in that show, and if you had gone into the museum or into that the Armory exhibition, which was you know sort of like in a convention center, the the side where the American artists were was was you could probably you know um, I mean it was, it was essentially empty because most people were standing looking at the Picasso paintings, all this Cubist stuff that no one had ever heard of, let alone seen before. So that kind of, um, having had that happen, I think probably made it clear in his own mind, but also in the minds of a lot of Americans that, you know, Child Hassam is now part of the, the previous generation. He's kind of a little bit, you know, over the hill, jumped the shark, and everyone's looking back towards Europe to see what uh, uh, what the next big thing is going to be. And, you know, he continues make, doing what he does. He, he doesn't go into, like, a whole um, cubist phase or anything. He kind of sticks to his guns. Uh, this here, you can see this is the, our painting today in the Oval Office in Washington. There's Barack Obama, one of the... when. Barack Obama was elected president in November 2008. He makes one of his first choices uh, because they give you the option to direct to decorate the White House and the Oval Office in whichever way you want using the the very deep collection of the White House and the National Gallery. And so this is one of the first artworks that he selects. Um, Barack Obama being a f pretty um, cultured, intelligent guy, I think made a pretty good choice here, right, to um, select this painting. So, let me see, is there anything else I want to mention? Just going to... Oh, I should say that today's painting was also purchased uh, during the Kennedy administration in the 1960s uh, for the White House collection. I don't think it was purchased by John F. Kennedy or Jacqueline Kennedy. It was probably purchased by, you know, art advisors who worked at the White House, the, the people in charge of the collection. Um, and as far as I know, it wasn't directly exhibited, at least not in the Oval Office, until Obama. Um, <laughs> and just this is interesting so he denounced modern trends in art to the end of his life and he termed he termed them art boobies 
all the painters, critics, collectors, and dealers who got on the bandwagon, promoted cubism, surrealism, and other avant-garde movements. Um, and until the, there was a um, reappraisal of American Impressionism in the 1960s, Hassam was considered to be one of the abandoned geniuses. That is interesting. Yeah, so obviously kind of goes... Uh, kind of disappears from the limelight, especially after he passes away in 1935. But uh, there's been, you know, a reappraisal of his work and the importance of his work in helping to establish the United States as uh, an independent cultural force, something that we just take for granted today. But there were people like Child Hassam who made, did the hard work to make that happen. So, as we turn, as we celebrate American independence on July 4th here, let's try our best to recreate this important and beautiful painting. So let's go to our next step. Oh, there's lots of comments on there. Uh, Tortilla Ref says, I love the backstories and context. Nice to hear about an American art and artist. I never learned enough about them as a European art historian. Interesting. Great to have you on the show. There's Pascal and Kathy there. Pascaline in the chat. Uh, and Lisa and John. Um, Paula says, I missed your notification today. I'm just on YouTube and I found it. I'm lucky. Thanks, Michael. And Lisa says, I've been to McSorley's in New York City. You're right. It is a cool place. Yeah. Coolest bar I've, I've ever been to. I think that was one of the first bars I ever went to. And, and uh, I don't know. If I, well, and my, my own dad snuck me into it. I think because he just wanted to go inside. Because when I was in art school in New York City, at least when I began, I wasn't legally old enough to go into a bar. So um, I remember we sat down in the back of that relatively small pub between a whole bunch of New York City police officers and members of the Hells Angels. It was just our little table, my dad and I sitting between, um, because the Hells Angels headquarters is like two or three doors down there. Um, you know, it was one of those places where people can be at, at war outside the doors. You walk in and everyone is friends. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Now, do we want to do an underpainting or do we want to just dive right into this? Let's just take a look at the painting itself and just see what work might need to be done here. Well, a few things that I'm, I'm seeing here. Let's keep on zooming in. So what we can see here is this little bit of a peachy color. I think that's probably his canvas or an input amateur. It's probably the canvas, which is, you know, like a, here's like a canvas tote bag, right? That's your canvas color, right? So that's probably him. So one thing the impressionists often did not do was use an imprimatura so i think you know i obviously i've used an imprimatura here but i think what i might do rather than do an underpainting is i might just put a, a little bit of a cool blue stain across most of this surface on top of the yellow and um so let's do that. I'm going to take, okay, so let's get some, I don't want to have too much white. So I'm taking white. I just put, oh, it's my slow dry medium. Oh, well, I thought that was, uh, what happened to my matte medium? Oh, here it is. 
got the wrong tube out. So I wanted to use matte medium. Instead, I just poured a whole bunch of slow dry medium on here, which is going to slow the drying time down here. In fact, I'm going to put more matte medium just to, to thin out my slow dry medium. Now this might give this painting a little bit of a slight greenish quality. Because we're painting blue over top of yellow and so they might mix a little bit optically. That's too turn out okay. So I'm just doing this as a way of like speeding up this process. Of, um, of just getting color on here. So I don't have to paint so many little tiny blue brush strokes here. I'll already have a bit of Just, uh, let's see these side by side. So you can see, I still have this kind of like little bits of yellow kind of poking through here. Obviously it's different than if it was this a little bit more of a peachy, unbleached titanium kind of thing. But I think that's probably good, good enough to kind of get us started here. So we've got that warm yellow, cool blue over top. Now, because there is some slow dry medium in here that I mistakenly put in there, it's going to slow the drying time down. So I'm going to blow dry it because otherwise this could stay wet for another 20 minutes. So I don't mind mixing colors into this. And obviously, Child Hassam was painting with oil paint, which is all wet, and he's probably painting it quite quickly. But I think this is just going to make my life easier and maybe yours as well. Because if I'm not, if I'm having a hard time, <laughs> probably not going to be the most entertaining uh, episode. Or maybe it'll be really entertaining. Okay, I suspect that this will still be wet for, it's still kind of tacky, but you know, I probably could blow dry it for another five minutes and still be a little bit wet because I did put a substantial amount of that slow dry medium in there. Um, okay, so I think what I'm gonna do now is move on just right into the background layer. This wasn't really 
you know, a typical kind of underpainting. A little bit more of kind of like sometimes I use that, do this at the same time I do my imprimatur. But. Okay, so now um, let's start working around in our background. We're going to mix some cool blues uh, and put those into the sky and into the, the buildings that are furthest. And then we're going to work our way forward in the painting. In fact, maybe let's just take a look at the colors. So really up here in the sky, because I like starting with the things that are furthest, we're going to be using white and cool blue. You can see there is some cool purples happening in here. Um, but he's really using, like, I mean, you could see very, I mean, he's using warm and cool colors uh, at their, uh, for their greatest effect here. You've got cool blues and you've got warm blues. And what pops forward the most is this solid warm blue. And that comes versus, you could see that he used cooler blues to paint that very same part of the American flag. And he did that deliberately to keep those colors in the background so they're not competing with the American flags that are right up close to the front of the picture plane. So, Paul says, Hi Kathy, how did you find out about today's class? I checked on it last night, no notes there. Uh, I post everything on the Facebook group and uh, on, but this usually in the mornings, there was something on the Facebook group. Anyway, so let's, um, the other thing too is we're going to be using mostly smaller brushes throughout most of this episode, which is one thing that can take a little bit of time because it, instead of using big brushes and then working our way to small brushes, the impressionists are often using maybe smaller brushes for the majority of a session. I think, maybe just before I go off and start blabbing around, let's just take a look. Yeah. Still in the, almost all the same size brush throughout this entire painting. Maybe a bigger one when we get up close, but... Okay, so let's, let's um, paint this here. I'm just going to mix right in here. I'm just going to take my white paint. I'm just going to use this existing blue that's right here. And... So what I see are these sort of like get a little bit more blue in there. Oops, that's probably a bit too much.
That might I might even want to lighten that up a little bit. But we'll just leave that like that for right now. Now let's just kind of scoop down. Now I'm gonna get a little bit more cool blue into this mixture. Not too much, because the the more intense a color is, the more it's going to move forward. And by intensity, I just mean uh, the less... A, a color is most intense when it comes right out of the tube. The more other colors you mix into it, the less intense it is. It's diluting the strength, the saturation of that color. And nothing has a bigger effect than adding white or black to um, reduce the saturation of a color. Just laying in. A bunch of these colors. And notice how they're kind of just all a bunch of just long brush strokes. So these are all vertical lines. And then for the water, we start getting these more horizontal, or the water, not the, the, the road, right? You know, as I'm working on this painting, I'm just thinking about, like, Hassam and his um, how he made so much work, and how I think important it is, if you're a beginner artist, to also just kind of fearlessly make lots of work, and not be so afraid to, to fail I think we can learn a lot about like this reminds me a lot of like one of the a book that I um, make all of my students, my university students read is called Art and Fear. Um, let me just bring that book up. So I make all my students read this book, 
art and fear and i'm not the only one there's a lot of teachers art teachers around the world i'm sure who recommend this book you can probably buy lots of used copies because there's lots that uh, students buy and then they want to get rid of them they want <laughs> but i think it's a great book because it um uh, one of the things it really advocates for is is making lots of work rather than trying to make one perfect work. When you're when you're just learning, I think sometimes people become obsessed with sort of fixing a painting that they're not happy with. Just like move on, keep on going. Don't don't obsess over it. Like I was I was talking to a, a student I had in person just the other day, and they said. They're like showing me a painting on their phone that they've said they've been working on for the past two years. And as soon as they said that, I was like, you gotta just stop working on this painting. I don't even need to see. And they're like, oh no, but listen. And I'm like, just stop. It's, there's no point. <laughs> you know, that, because they're like, tell me how I can make this one better. I'm like, you can't. It's like, just, you're, you're wasting your time fiddling with that painting you gotta just move on you're gonna you'll learn way more if you do five new paintings than you would by spending the next year of your life trying to fix this painting or making it better guaranteed 100 percent. i don't think there's many artists who would disagree with that advice and there's pascal uh, saying the hmm, the original was forty two inches by twenty two, yeah, Pascal. We I did talk all about the difference in dimensions of these two paintings already. So very very well aware. I showed some images of of the uh, the original here. Almost, ev pretty much every single painting we've done uh, is not nine by twelve size proportionally. They're often there. Are, many of them are square. Many of them are taller, more rectangular, and I just sort of use Photoshop to, to kind of widen the paint. Generally, I'm not cropping anything out. Most of the time, just adding extra stuff on the on the edges there. So, I think that's pretty good as a start. You know what? Maybe I will use some cool red after all okay and I am going to go down to a smaller brush and let's take some of this oops some white and a little bit of red that I can use hmm, I think it needs to be a bit more And I know these are going to be um, warmer reds here soon. I'm just kind of building. Part of the thing with Impressionism, you kind of build up layers of things, right? to 
So you notice there's these like flags on these posts here. And I don't mind if these um, these lines are a little bit uh, skewed or not particularly straight, or if the paint is a little bit thin. I love the way that he's sort of got this, these uh, reflections in the rain here. Uh, next, I'm going to take a little bit of my cool blue and cool purple, or cool, so my cool blue and cool red. That's going to make a purple. There's also a little bit of white in there. If I want to make it a very saturated purple, I would use my warm blue, but I don't want that. I want some that's a little bit less intense. So now I'm going to take this purple and paint it into the Back around here. Trying to paint in between the previous colors. I don't want to completely obliterate the little gaps between the, the paint. Because those are kind of nice seeing that the little bit of the imprimatura and the cool blue that's barely there. That's always very satisfying.
So obviously it's going to get darker here. We're just still building these layers up. So just put a little bit more white into this mixture. So really the most time consuming part of doing making an impressionist painting is just the building up of colors. Because whereas with a lot of the other techniques we've looked at, we might just use lots of different layers of paint to build that up. With impressionism, we're doing it with individual brush strokes. And it takes time to build up a, um, to build that paint up, right? It just, it'll look kind of thin and until that color starts to um, really uh, stand out as sort of like it comes together as we stand further back into kind of a unified shape because you know kind of famously you know impressionist painting can look kind of sloppy up close just a bunch of random brush strokes Totally, I get that. So this is the kind of thing that takes some time to build this up. Okay. So now I'm gonna add more color into here to make it a little bit less white. I think that's going to need to get much more blue in here as well. So, is that enough to move on? Like, obviously there's these light posts and things, but I'm gonna wait until, or not light posts, maybe telephone cable posts or something. I'll, I'll wait until I get more of the background done before I go in there. So, I 
think that's good for that stage. Oh, and there's Lolly there. We'll be painting uh, tonight, I'm afraid. I'm too tired for even one. But I'll catch up with this one tomorrow, maybe. Just finished my Cha Noir. Oh, awesome. That was the painting we made just the other day. Okay. I'm pretty confident and happy with the way that the first couple layers of paint have gone in the background. So let's now move to the foreground and let's paint some of the 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 much more intense, more saturated, warm colors because we've used all exclusively cool colors thus far. Cool blue, cool yellow, and you know mix them to or sorry, we've used cool blue and cool red and mix those together to make a purple and white all of which give it that kind of a distant kind of atmospheric quality well as colors get closer to the foreground they get more intense meaning we add little to no white or black and we're not using black in this painting at all anyway so let's just take a look here Okay, so let's just think to myself how I want to go about painting. I'm contemplating just going right into this area. You know what I think he's done here in order to cover well. Oh, you know what? Look at this. Where is this yellow and green coming from? Interesting. I don't I did not notice that earlier. If we do that, that would be something that we'd probably want to do now. Huh. Okay, so let's do... I'm going to do that first, actually. That is cool blue and cool yellow. Mostly cool yellow, though. So, I'm going to take my cool yellow... Maybe just a bit of white as well. So I've mixed this kind of greenish color. like he's painting a bit of this into what will be the stripes later on the the white stripes So I don't know why, like this is one of those things that I didn't notice at all until I start working on this painting. I'm like, oh, what is, oh, interesting. Oh, there's 
little bits of this in these uh, flags. I don't think he used this green for these figures. But I'm going to, because a lot of this is going to get painted over anyway. So it's kind of important that we basically, we're gonna kind of obscure all of this later on. What are you guys talking about, uh, Pascal Doctor Who sightings, Lolly? <laughs> Pascal's a big Doctor Who fan, interesting. I haven't watched too much Doctor Who, but I am a big fan of David Tennant. Um... He's a great actor. He did a, um, like a murder mystery show probably five years ago with Olivia Coleman. Is that her name? That is fantastic. What it's um, takes place in this little British seaside town. I think that's what the show's named after. I keep thinking of Bridgerton, but that's not that's not at all. Let me look it up. I gotta. Somebody will probably figure it out before I do here. Uh, Broad Church. That's it. Broad Church. What was. <laughs> This is excellent. One of my favorites is uh, <laughs> the way David Tennant refers to Olivia Coleman's character. Milla! Milla! <laughs> ah, Milla! Come on, Milla! Anyway. 
Uh, let's look back up here. I might have got. Did I go overboard with that green? I don't know. Remember, it's all going to get like 95% of going to get covered up with other colors, which is a big, you know, typical thing that impressionist painters do. So that we just see little bits of this and that color comes through in subsequent layers. Now, I'm just, okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to take my cool, cool, no, let's go for warm blue. Let's take our warm blue and lots of white. Maybe even a little bit of cool blue in here. Get a bit more of a cobalt blue, the, the blue that's kind of in between those blues. And I'm going to add a little bit of matte medium to this. That's going to make this paint a little bit more transparent. Maybe not much. I could add a lot more if I wanted. But, um, and see how kind of loosely I'm painting this in here. The goal is not just to completely cover all of this up. So this is going to be white lines eventually. So why does he paint blue underneath these white lines? Is, is, was it, did he make a mistake? Did he forget the colors of the of his own um, flag? Well, I mean, it's possible. Very unlikely. I think what he's doing is just doing what the Impressionists have always done, is kind of building up layers of paint. even put a bit of this underneath the red actually you can see how transparent well that's I say that and then I, I get one that's particularly opaque but uh, for the most part fairly transparent Okay, I love how this is turning out. 
I, I'm, I'm, I guarantee you, if um, I'm sure some people maybe even tuning in right now are like, what? Where did he get all that green? That just seems crazy. He must be colorblind. Well, it's possible. Uh, um, but what I think, you know, I'm just trying to build up this layer of complexity. It's like, a, you know, a baker. Like, what? why go to all the trouble of, you know, when you're making a croissant, of folding it, like, hundreds and hundreds of times, that dough, right? Why, why not just fold it once, throw it in the oven, and be done with it? Well, it's not going to taste as great. Yeah, technically, the same elements are there, but it's, you know, the building up of those layers is what's going to make that painting look a little more complex. I think if we just go in and we could do this you know let's say i was teaching this painting for five-year-old kids well we would do we probably could do this in half an hour and we would take all the complexity out we wouldn't be layering green i wouldn't you know i would just just go right to the colors we need do it and move on right um, but to kind of really understand how child has sound this painting we we need to to build that extra layer of complexity in here uh, Deborah says, I love what you're doing, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> um, Deborah says, I am watching and doing Steinland's cat with with my own cat, of course. Happy fourth to our American friends. Well, he says, Michael, the painting looks beautiful already. Gorgeous already. Beautiful pastel version. Thanks. Well, it's it's going to go get less pastel here soon. Um Once some of the, like the past, pastel is basically taking any color and mixing white into it. That's what makes a pastel, right? And by, and pastel is essentially a color that's become desaturated by tinting it, by adding white to it, right? So a tint is basically a, a kind of pastel. The less white we put in there, the more saturated and bright that color is, the more it's going to want to come forward. So Impressionists always, they used a lot of white in their painting because it gives a lot of atmosphere, right? It makes things that are further away appear far away. So as the colors get closer to the foreground, even some of the cool colors were using less and less to, to little or no white by the time we get up close. So like this area of the painting we're expected to use almost fully saturated colors colors coming right out of the tube and that's going to pop them forward especially compared to the more pastel colors in the background so do i want to break out so I, I mean, let me just articulate the 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 questions I'm asking myself right now is how do I, I, I I'm trying to decide do I want to go into the blue this warm blue now or do I want to start doing some white and I don't think it makes a difference but I'm just trying to you know chess move myself a few steps ahead here and think does it matter if I go like, what is essentially the fastest method? Most efficient method. I think it is hard to say. I think what he's doing here is painting... I think he's going back and forth. I think he might have painted some white and then painted some blue, painted some blue around the white um, I think I think I'm gonna go blue but I'm going to add matte medium in here. So basically, so this is matte medium. It's not white. 
it's clear paint without any pigment. And I'm going to mix in some warm blue right out of the tube into this mixture. So essentially, unlike if I added white to this, I would have a pastel and I'm going to reduce the saturation here. I'm kind of reducing the saturation a little bit because I'm making it more transparent. Uh, so there's less pigment there, but the color isn't really being tinted. It's just becoming more transparent. So I can paint over areas without completely obliterating them. so that I can kind of keep you know, these greens and things in there. Now, in fact, I'm going to keep rather than clean that brush, I'm going to take this blue. Actually, you know what? I gotta be careful about making these nice, pretty little circles because they're obviously they're stars, and not circles. So let's, uh, you know, sometimes I go to great lengths to try to keep those kind of shapes uniform. Here, I want to kind of let them get a little bit out of control. Same sort of thing, I'm taking this lighter, this is basically sort of like my white with a little bit of cool blue 
and a little bit of cool warm blue. So I got both blues in there. I'm going to make this more transparent again. So I'm going to put more solid white over parts of this at some point here, but not just yet. Well, he says, I don't think uh, I saw your version of the Blue Dog, Deborah. I'll have to scour the feedback video to see if it's been on there yet. It won't be on there probably for a few more months until we let a uh, few more people catch up to that episode. Um, but it's on their Facebook group. Okay. Are we ready to put some red in here. Let's put some um, warm red finally here. So again, I'm going to put a little bit of matte medium in there. And I'm going to mix a bit of red in here. It's going to make that color transparent. You know what? I will also add some white. Just to give it a little bit more of a pinkish quality. Now you can see it's it looks very similar to the cool red that we put in originally in all of these stripes. It's similar, but not the same. Again, I'm using a smaller, thinner brush to do this. I could use a big, wide brush. Um, but I might just kind of get rid of any nuance.
So now I'm kind of adding a bit of this warm red over top of areas where I had a cool red. So now I've got different reds, different layers of complexity. Another thing I'm trying to be careful of is just having perfectly straight lines and that every line, every stripe on the flag is the same width, right? Some of those, you know, I mean, it doesn't look like this is a very windy day. It looks like because it's raining, the, the, the flags are getting soaked and they're probably hanging straight down. Yet there's, they're probably going to kind of curl and, you know, sometimes a wet you know, uh, the flag, maybe part of it's going to fold back and stick to the other side a little bit. So if I, I, and I'm doing that because otherwise I don't want it just to look like a whole bunch of like clip art flags here. I want them to, to be dynamic, just like his painting. Okay, I think I'm ready to go into just warm blue on its own. So would it be faster to have just done this warm blue quickly as a layer rather than sort of painting around these little stars. Totally. And that was, you know, 10, 20 minutes ago when I was sort of debating. This is one of the things I was thinking, Do I should, how, what is the best method to attack this little area here? And I decided rather than trying to do that all at once and just lay in a big flat area that I'm going to take the longer approach here which is to kind of paint around some of these and maybe over top a few of them too as a way of of making sure that the that the painting doesn't get too clean and pretty and perfect.
So I'm just using a, a fairly small brush here. Again, so that these appear like small little brush strokes. I'm trying to go quickly so I don't get bogged down in details. Take a little bit, I'll just take that color. Let's take this. Oops. Basically, I'm just mixing white into my blue here. So again, if I just paint warm blue right here, that warm blue is going to compete with the flag in the foreground. So I have to kind of dilute it. And then as we go further back, there's more and more white. So that feels maybe like a little bit too warm. Interesting, all these dark spots. What is that? Um, let's go down to these figures.
I'm just going to take some warm blue right out of the Lolly says, I'm so sleepy tonight, you're way too relaxing to watch, Michael. So just in case I don't make it to the end of the video, just I want to say thanks for all your amazing work, Michael. I appreciate these so much. Aw, you're so sweet, Lolly. Um, <laughs> Deborah says, the colors are so dreamy. Yes, I am sleepy also, Lolly. <laughs> A little bit of ASMR here. You're just slowly talking quietly as I apply paint to the surface. Yeah, I guess yeah, it's very dreamy. Yeah. As we I mean, it, it has that, I mean, the idea of, like, the avenue in the rain, like, you know, when we think of rain, rain tends to make people sleepy anyway, right? It's kind of calming, soothing, that repetitive sound, you know, it just, you know, the, the sky kind of gets a little bit dark, you know, can appear later on in the evening than it actually is, and, uh, you know, you don't really want to go outside, you just kind of curl up under a blanket and you're reading a book and before you know it you wake up and it's the sun's out or something, right? Next day. So yeah, I totally get that. You know, the the, the it if it appears sort of like we're walking or driving and there's rain on the window and the water sort of streaking down or something. Um I'm just wondering, is it, do, should I go into the background some more now? Are we... Yeah, okay. Okay, I think we've got a, a really good painting established here. We've got background and foreground elements in place. Now let's just go back to the background and ideally we could wrap up the background so that we can wrap up the foreground. So let's just look at these side by side and just compare them. I think we want to do a little bit more purple back here. I mean, it's, I guess, everything is going to kind of darken down another like 20 30 percent even though i do really like what's going on there that being a little bit lighter but i think we do want to just push the contrast a little bit more so in order to do that i'm taking i've got my cool red let's just mix a bigger batch here cool red Cool blue again. I'm just going to take some of the white that was up here. I'm 
Now that's probably too dark just by a little, so I'm just going to use up some excess white. And you, again, you can see, like, I'm using white that's got other colors in it. And, you know, it's not a perfect pure mixture because I don't need it to be. Let's zoom in and just see what, if we can see what he's doing here. Okay, now let's go back to our cool blue here. And I'm also, one thing I want to try doing too is not mixing the color in perfectly either. So I get a little bit of a few different colors. more and more just cool blue 
on its own. Well, not quite on its own. Still quite a lot of like white mixed in here, but it sometimes squeaks out a little bit and that's okay. Okay, I think what I'm going to do now is mix a black. I don't need to make a huge mixture of it because I'm not going to use too much of it. So take my cool blue, cool yellow, and warm red, mix that together. It's going to give me a nice dark color, because all those colors cancel each other out. One thing I hear when people are doing this is they're like, ah, it's, it's, you know, it still looks a little brown or purple. And that's true. But it's also, I, I'll, I'll, so I'm standing next to him, I'll say, but you just keep mixing that in. It's not, you haven't, there's all, you know, it's not uh, mixed in well enough. Okay, so we've got this black. Obviously we could use real black. But this black is all we need. Now let's take... I'm going to take a bit of that. Take the rest of my cool blue. So I'm sort of just making a much more blue color there. Or a much more bluish black.
Not sure how that happened, where I, that doesn't overlap the flag in behind there so much, but whatever. Maybe that's a bit too bold. Let's just make it a bit more blue. take a little bit of my cool blue, a little bit of black, a little bit of white, just a little bit of a gray. Now let's kind of go the opposite direction. I want to take mostly white, but I'm just, I didn't wash my brush, so it already comes out a little bit blue. And we have a little bit of white spots in places back here.
that just a bit. Opaque. Remember, I'm not doing all of these lines. You can see I'm kind of jumping around, bouncing back and forth. They're not all big solid lines because they don't exist on a computer, right? They're slightly different colors in different places as they reflect lights on the street. And Paul says, hi, Michael, can we do a Canadian flag next time? <laughs> um, sure, maybe, well, I was, I, we're, next week was a painting I was going to do for Canada Day, but I didn't have, I wasn't able to get away for Canada Day, so next Tuesday is Alexander Colville, who's one of Canada's great painters. It was going to be the Canada Day painting, but it's not a Canadian flag, but it's a, uh, Kind of Canadian themed. Okay. I think that's good for now. I think I'm going to move into the foreground again. Okay, we're getting close. Really, um, we just want to put some more warm blue and warm red, maybe a little bit of white into this painting, and we're going to be getting pretty close. And then the last little bit, the touch-ups, depending on how we feel about it, that could be the, where you spend the most amount of your time, just kind of clarifying little things. And that's, that's kind of, for some people, the trickiest part of an Impressionist painting. Anyway, there's where we're at thus far. Let's see them side by side. So maybe let's just jump right in to our warm red here, right out of the tube. We're not going to use it everywhere like this. And again, you can see I'm using a small brush.
right so all of a sudden that contrast of this very intense red makes a huge difference doesn't it Just painting some red into the where the blue is going to go. That's going to make that blue go really dark. Same sort of thing. He says, I'd love to do a Canadian flag too someday. Interesting. Okay, well, I'll have to take a look. Who's done a Canadian flag themed painting? I think there's Joyce Wheeland. Might have done something like that. I'm just going to go back to my white. I mean, this is something that, uh, of all people, Thomas Kincaid would say. You, you know, keep on adding white to get like the highlights, to, to get something, to get a really strong contrast. You got to paint white and then you got to let that dry and then you put white over top of the white and then you let that dry and put white over top of the white. Sometimes you do three or four. And I'm not kidding. You can. There's interviews with him talking about his process where he says literally that same sort of thing. Because as this dries, it's going to be maybe a little bit more transparent. There's also, we deliberately spent all that time building up these layers underneath that are going to dull that white down a little bit. And we want that. We, we want that. But in order to get some highlights back in here, we now need to kind of go back and paint pure white out of the tube back into certain places.
reckon some of the, my some of this white just picking up some of the red paint that's still a little bit wet. That's okay. In fact, I think that's great. Okay, let's go back to the... In fact, actually, I'm going to blow dry that. So now this is, again, just my warm blue on its own. And I'm painting over some areas where I had just some warm red that I put there. That warm red is going to interact with my warm blue and make for some very dark areas. Now, obviously, I can paint with black as well, but they're just going to... It's going to make for like a really deep, dark uh, color there. And it almost looks like he did something similar. Either he mixed that paint there like that.
take uh, let's just take our warm blue and mix it right into the black for just a slightly different effect. It's important to remember that the Impressionist rarely used black. They did use black on occasion, but they would sort of go out of their way to avoid using it because black right out of the tube is such an intense dominating color that it would kind of quiet the whole painting down. And they were really up for really bright, super saturated, intense paintings. Darken some of these stars a bit with a little bit of gray. Okay. Uh, 
Paul says, I'd like to do one of a, a painting that you create. Let's do, or Kathy said, let's do one of Michael's great idea. Dolly says, just adding my vote in to do Markowski original on one of the streams sometime. I think that would be a great idea, and we can learn a little bit more about our favorite artists. <laughs> you guys are so sweet. I appreciate that. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to our f really final step here and do some finishing touches. Uh, really what I want to do at this stage, because I've got all the paint roughly in the right places, what I want to do is maybe clarify a few things, clarify the space, um, meaning maybe add some colors that contrast each other a little bit more than currently are. Um, so just put one or two little brush strokes next to some, like, let's say a, a light brush stroke next to a dark brush stroke, and that will kind of clarify the edge of, of a shape or the opposite. Maybe I feel like, oh, that's a little bit too, you know, too of a, much of a contrast. I'm going to soften that contrast a little bit. So we're getting pretty close and let's, this, this might be the kind of situation that might take some people the longest you if you can get it to this place that feels good and maybe some people would be very happy with the painting like this but you know maybe we want to do a little bit of fine tuning around here and like this is you know uh child hassam was a very fast painter so i don't think he would have fiddled with anything too much but it wouldn't have surprised me if you know he got a bunch of these paintings done at the same time or he's working on maybe five or six and then he kind of gets them to this stage and is like, okay, that's good. Let's uh, let's think about it. And then rather than working on five paintings simultaneously, he's going to dial into each one and finish each one. Because uh, I almost feel like he must have been working on like an assembly line. Like when they, you know, when it says that he would make, you know, 500 paintings over the course of a winter, right? I don't, it's not like he's working on, you know, one painting for three hours, done. Another painting, three hours, done. I think he's probably working on, like, he's got, you know, a huge assembly line in his studio, and he's working on a little bit, goes, works a little bit, works a little bit. Okay, let's do this, like, while he's got that same color um, started. So he might make one painting like this, uh, and then make reproductions or duplicates versions of it each time i don't know it's it'd be interesting to really dive into his whole working process i'm sure that information is out there somewhere but uh um okay let's just use my warm blue here So I'm painting warm blue over top of areas that had red and black. It's just making for a really deep warm blue.
Let's zoom in here. bit of a gray happening here. So it looks like he probably spent the majority of his time on this painting in this particular area. Around these figures. Now, this kind of thing is pretty tricky to do with acrylic paint because everything dries so quickly that trying to kind of blend the colors in the same way that he did is super frustrating because you just, you, you can't, right? It just won't, it's all dry. So, uh, one thing I'm doing here is just, uh, Picking out some of the really intense whites out of down here. A lot more gray down on the bottom half of the painting here. Not surprising that you'd have like a lot more gray at the bottom because that's of course where the street is and the street's probably going to have a bit of a grayish quality anyway. Um, I'm going to add a bit of matte medium in here. It's like some white, a little bit of my black, get a gray. Let's take a bit of blue.
Do I have any cool blue left? Let's take a bit more of that. So he's got a little bit of this cool blue kind of coming back in to the foreground. There's no law against it. That's a tricky area to pull off here. So like one of the things that I find myself doing is I look at it at one time and I go, whoa, I need to add a lot more white and brighten that area up. And then 10 minutes later looking at it, I'm like, oh, it needs to be much darker. I need to get some grays in there. And it doesn't mean that I got it wrong the first time and now I'm seeing it more clearly. It's just that I'm just, you know, the painting is changing. It's a living thing. It's each time I add a new brush stroke to it, it changes the overall look of the whole painting. And so I have to kind of, uh, you know, reconcile all those things each time I go over the painting. You also notice, you know, just if you're watching me, you can see that as the painting's progressing, especially at this stage, I'm very seldomly looking at the screen where the artwork is. Interesting. Heidi says, uh, this painting reminds me of the University of Punjab, which was done with a knife by, uh, oh goodness, what was her name? Or what is her, or what was her name? Oh my goodness. I'm having a hard day with names today. <sighs> oh, this is going to drive me crazy. We've done a lot of paintings, <laughs> so uh, remembering every detail of each artist kind of is tricky, but... Uh... Let's take a little bit of red and bring this into the gray. Kind of what I'm after is a bit just like a muddy color. There we go. Actually, that's perfect. It's kind of muddy. Yes, that's what everyone's wanted, this 
muddy reddish color. That's... There we go. That, that's, you know, sometimes it takes a while of just like fiddling around, mixing colors before the right one just sort of pops out. Okay, I feel like I could use a bit of, well, maybe I was going to say use a bit more elsewhere, but maybe I might be, show a little bit of restraint. So mix, putting a little bit of this grayish red into a few places on the flags themselves to act as like a bit of a shadow, right? To make these flags look like they're, you know, there's wrinkles in them. And Honestly, I feel like I could keep doing more and more and more of this. Um, let's back mount. It's got these sort of diagonal lines happening too in a few places. Yeah, I didn't realize just how much more gray I needed in the bottom half of the painting until I got to this stage here. I'm going to move on from that because I feel like I could just do that forever. Let's get some more 
white. Oops. Uh, I just want to do a few more pops of white. Um, I notice a bit of warm yellow and white.
So I wonder what those are. I don't know if those are street lamps or maybe just the windows that are illuminated. People sitting in their homes reading the paper. Getting rid of some of that white, maybe is a little bit intense down there. I think really what I want to do is maybe a little bit of warm red, warm blue, and then we're done. Oops, it didn't dry that brush off, so water just leaked right up off that brush.
So I'm just going for the little bit of slightly gray cool blue. Because there's this the way that this sort of just leaks down like the it's almost like the city's melting back here, I feel. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Uh, Heidi says, Anna Molka Ahmed um, was the artist that we were talking about. Uh, the University of Punjab painting we painted with a palette knife. That was maybe two years ago. <laughs> um, I loved that painting. That was, that was a really good one. That was one that um, I don't often paint with palette knives. So that was kind of just for me kind of great giving myself permission to use a tool I don't use very often I don't know if it you know converted me into using palette knives at all or more often but you know just sometimes switching up your tool for just one painting just maybe helps you appreciate what your what your tool can do right you're like oh wow I should, I should give my paintbrush a little bit more love. Look how difficult it is to paint without it. when I thought I was like ah okay I'll, oh no I thought I was like oh it's seconds away from being done
Okay, I think, uh, I think that's good. I don't foresee it getting much better. Falling Snow says it feels calming to look at. I agree 100%. And Pokemon Daily says hello. Hi. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, begin to wrap up here. So we're at that point in today's episode where we're going to take a look at both paintings side by side, give uh, myself some feedback and see, you know, if uh, hopefully we're done, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, just before we do that, uh, again, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when future videos are coming up. Um, comment on videos, comment on, comment on past videos. Um, you know, if you found something useful, just make a little, you know, couple of words. That makes a huge difference for a YouTuber. Can't uh, overstate how e how how helpful that is. Um, especially if you're unable to contribute anything financially, a comment or two is is worth its weight in gold. Um, but if you want to support the channel with a small donation, as little as twenty five cents via PayPal, super chat, uh, e transfer. You can, all those links are down below. My emails on the Facebook group and on my website. Check all that out. Um, and so let's see. Um, these two side by side. So I feel pretty good about that. I feel like maybe I could have pushed the contrasts even more up here. And this area here, I could have got even more ambiguous. Like this, he left that, you know, I've almost clarified it, whereas his was a little bit, you know, ambiguous as to like, are those four women walking with umbrellas or you know I, I mean that's kind of maybe what it looks like I don't but I don't know um, so I guess when I was doing it, I was like oh I don't know it's starting to look a little muddy I, but that's the difference between myself and a great artist like child Hassan that he can get away with something kind of ambiguous just for, from the sheer technical ability if I was to maybe spend the next 20 years of my life painting impressionist paintings like this, maybe I would be able to get those subtleties a little bit um, more easily. But I think for all intents and purposes, that's not bad, right? Um, let's zoom in on a few things. Let's maybe, let's go where we started, up in the top left corner. Okay, so I'm, you know, obviously some of these colors are going to be a little bit different and his painting was about three times the size of mine. So he's got a little bit more detail that he can get in there. I mean, I just noticed this little bit of green that would be up here, kind of emerald green. I'm just going to leave it, but it's just, it's one of those things, the more and more you look, well, and there's another, there's a little... American flag that I could have put somewhere right about there. Looks like I guess there was another American flag that I've omitted. You can see like his, um, I don't know, what, I guess electrical uh, pole or whatever that might be, is more. Mine is more defined than his. Uh, his signature, I didn't. I decided not to do just because of the way it's put in there. But uh, it's February nineteen seventeen. So here you have a bunch of America, well, 
There's a, a lot of patriotism because America has just recently entered the war, World War One, right? Hence all the American flags. Um, yeah, these figures. I feel like I did okay here. I feel like if I had a canvas that was three times the size, maybe I could do a little bit more work in here. But I'm I'm satisfied. It does look to me like in a few places that he used maybe a rag to wipe some paint away. And, um, he's using kind of like a dry brush even to kind of scrape into the paint. So I think he really probably spent the majority of his time on that part of the painting. Uh, some of the stuff on the right, on the far right, is just Photoshop that I've put in this whole right side of the painting from where you see the cursor going up and down. It doesn't actually exist there, so... But, you know, you can see kind of how I interpreted that area. Using horizontal marks for the ground and vertical for the the stripes on the flags and also for a bit of the buildings in the background. You know, maybe I could have used a bit more of a gray for some of those stars on those these flags here. Um, I mean, I probably could use a little bit more gray all around here. But, you know, one thing I am happy with is because I layered paint, you know, layer after layer after layer, we get kind of little effects like that, that that look exactly like what he's done. Are the colors exactly right? Not really. I suspect a little bit of the yellowish quality in the original painting might be the varnish, which always tends to kind of give it a bit of a yellowy quality, warm yellow. Um... I'm just looking at this. The, that's way too many stripes on that American flag. Uh, how did that happen? Huh. I guess the, it should have ended there and then these stripes from behind come in. It doesn't bother me. I mean, it's possible that it's, well, I don't know. Hmm. It's okay. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, I, I guess I could sit here and try to fix that I don't mind I mean we're looking it's it's sort of like all of these American flags that are just sort of blurring together I think this is another one of those paintings where, you know, a few hours from now, when I'm not looking at the original and just looking at the painting on its own, I'll feel much, much happier about it. I'm not unhappy with it, but it's just hard to see it on its own and appreciate it for what it is rather than from what it's not. Pokemon Daily says, I was just watching your old live streams of basic drawing and learning lots. Awesome. And Heidi corrected uh, me here. Anna Mulka Ahmed, who painted the Department of Fine Arts Punjab. That's right. Thank you for correcting me. Um, Paul says, it was raining yesterday in Edmonton. Was, I got pretty wet from walking. <laughs> okay. Wow. Another painting done. Um, next week we're going to be looking at one of the great Canadian artists of all time and probably one of the most famous Canadian paintings of all time painting by Alex Colville 
Um, a famous painting of a horse running towards a train which is speeding towards it. Um, I love that painting. It's uh, and I it's been I think on postage stamps here in Canada. Probably maybe not as many people outside of Canada know it, but uh, we'll we'll have a few hours staring at it, so you'll get to know it pretty well. Okay, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening. Those of you, my good friends down south in the United States, happy Independence Day. Enjoy the rest of your 4th of July. Be careful with those fireworks. Don't want anybody to miss any fingers next week. <laughs> Always seems to happen after a few beers, the fireworks come out on Independence Day and somebody uh, regrets it. So drive safe and we'll see you guys all next week. Same time, same place. Thank you everybody for um, all the wonderful, generous comments in the chat. It's always wonderful to uh, be a part of this incredible community. I can't wait to see you again next week. Take care, everybody. Good night. <laughs> okay. Here we are.